Hello and welcome to the weekly fantasy football show here on Bleacher Report, brought to you by State Farm. My name is Adam Levitan of EstablishTheRun.com, joined each and every week here by Mike Leone of EstablishTheRun.com. Mike, how's it going today? It's going well. Excited to be back for week two. Yes. Can't believe it. They're having us back here for week two. This week, we are going to talk about some guys who dudded in week one, but we still think have a chance to perform in week two and some guys that were likely starting, depending on our other options, but likely starting here in week two. Do not think they are going to dud again. I know a lot of people are frustrated with some of the way their players performed in week one. The first thing I would say is that scoring was down massively across the entire NFL. I mean, we're talking 10 or 15 touchdowns lighter than a normal week one. So it was very, very, very low scoring in week one. I wouldn't worry about that. It was also unique in that there were so many injuries. I mean, coming into week one, there were more injuries than usual. And during the games, a lot of guys left and came back and a lot of guys got hurt for real. We'll talk through a bunch of those here today. A guy who didn't get hurt but is playing tonight and airballed in week one is Dallas Goddard, Leone. Now, I think we can explain away this Goddard thing pretty easily. Eagles got out to a 16-0 lead very quickly. Patriots annually, especially since they got Kyle Duggar, but annually, one of the best teams in the league against the tight end position. After the game, Eagles coaches come out and say, no, 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 we need to get the ball to Dallas Goddard. So, man, I'm actually like, excited to see what Dallas Goddard does tonight. I actually think he'll be featured here tonight in this game against the Vikings. And I don't think like panic level on Dallas Goddard for me right now would be like zero, maybe Leone, where are you at on Dallas Goddard heading into tonight? Yeah, I think it's panic level zero as well. Um, It was a weird game last week, just the way the script happened with Philly getting that early defensive touchdown. They were kind of playing from ahead. It was also not the best weather game, you know, on the road to start off, uh, you know, the, the first week of the season. So I'm not concerned. We've seen when this team has their big three pass catchers with AJ Brown, Devonta Smith and Dallas Goddard, it's really concentrated on those three guys, which means there's enough volume for all of them. Cause there's not a lot of ancillary targets going elsewhere. They've got a really high team total tonight of 28. And we actually have Goddard as a top five option at the tight end position this week. It's, it's kind of tight there towards the back of the top five, but tight ends are really volatile position. So as bad as an air ball looks, I think you've got to go back to the well. It's pretty unlikely on, on most of your rosters, you have a better tight end option than Goddard. Oh, for sure. And this Minnesota secondary, I mean, I know they looked okay against the Bucks. That was Baker Mayfield. I think Jalen Hurts comes out and shreds a really talent troubled Vikings secondary tonight a guy that i maybe a little bit more concern on t higgins got eight targets in the game against the browns and came down with none of them now i don't even know that any of these were catchable i mean burrow was out of control bad the Bengals were out of control bad it was raining it wasn't great weather browns could have a really good defense this year and i think that's also one thing that we should know there's some very very good defense in the nfl this year i think the jets are elite the cowboys are probably elite and the 49ers might be elite on defense. Browns could be really, really good on defense too. T. Higgins' matchup this week is against the Ravens. What did you think of T. Higgins' air ball here in week one, Leone? Yeah, T. Higgins had the fourth most air yards in week one, but we do like to call them prayer yards because a lot of them weren't really catchable. His thing has never really been getting a ton of separation, but he can win kind of these 50-50 balls. I think... Honestly, I think it's a good sign that his target share was up there. You know, Jamar Chase obviously emerged as the alpha last season and really separated himself in target share from T. Higgins, but Higgins is still clearly the the number two here. And that that was reestablished week one, even though the actual results weren't there. The usage was there. And it was just a horrible game. You know, the, the Bengals couldn't block. Burrow looked awful. The weather wasn't great. Um these things happen. It was an ugly week one across, you know, the, the league. And if you look at other players that were targeted and had the type of air yards that T Higgins had, you know, everybody else had at least 50 yards. So I think we're going to see some serious regression positively come towards T Higgins way right away here in week two. It, it, the, the thing that I go back to on T is I, I think the Bengals like him, but they're not going to pay him. Right. And like he, there was a bunch of contract stories that came out before week one. I think they like him. They just can't afford to pay him. I mean, they paid 
Joe Burrow. They're going to have to pay Jamar Chase. It's not going to be possible really for them to pay T. Higgins also, but for him to be out there and get eight targets kind of quells any of those fears. Let's keep it moving here to a controversial one, Leone Christian oh Kirk. So Christian Kirk was very good last year. I, I, you know, adding Calvin Ridley does two things to Christian Kirk. First, Calvin Ridley's going to eat up a ton of targets. He's awesome at football. Second, when they go into three wide receiver sets, I'm sorry, when they're in two wide receiver sets, they are rolling with Zay Jones and Calvin Ridley, not Christian Kirk. So Christian Kirk is getting squeezed on how often he's on the field, and he's getting squeezed on target share because Calvin Ridley is out there. So I have positive things to say about Christian Kirk, but I just wanted to start there on Christian Kirk. Leone, any thoughts on his usage? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a little concerned as someone who was super bullish on Christian Kirk heading into the year. Kind of my take was that like the preseason usage in two wide receiver sets, like we don't totally know what teams are doing. And I think they're going to be in 11 a lot anyways. It's not going to matter a ton. And, you know, even if Ridley has this big target share and is somewhat an alpha, this team's going to throw enough to get there. And Christian Kirk's really good. And, and this whole Jacksonville offense is going to pay off. But what we saw was a combination of so many things. We saw the Ridley alpha. We saw Kirk not playing in two wide receiver sets. We also saw the team play more two wide receiver sets than I expected mm -hmm. and just run more than I expected. They also threw a Travis Etienne out of the backfield a lot, something they didn't do last year. So there are a whole lot of things sort of working together. And I don't know how much of that was game, game plan specific against like Anthony Richardson and the Colts and maybe playing a little more conservatively. My hunch is week two here against Kansas City, they're going to have to play a bunch of three wide receiver sets. They're going to be throwing a lot more frequently, more in line with what we expected over the course of this season. So I think Kirk's going to be really up and down over the course of the year. I'm not nearly as excited for him as I was entering week one, but week two specifically seems like the right spot to play him. I would be playing Christian Kirk here in week two. Like Leone said, they were in three wide receiver base a lot last year, way more than they showed in week two, I'm sorry, in week one, maybe that was because they weren't playing the Chiefs. And now Travis Kelsey is going to be back. Chiefs are going to score a lot of points here in this game. I think we know that. And they're going to need to be an 11 base, three wide receiver base. And they're going to need Christian Kirk out there. So, yeah, I would not be selling Christian Kirk right now. If you want to sell Christian Kirk, I'm okay with that. But I would wait until after this Chiefs game. You're just not going to get anything for Christian Kirk right now. All right. Um, before we get to numbers four, five, and six here, first three guys that we mentioned, and again, here we're talking about guys who were duds in week one that we'd, we would still start in week two. First three guys we discussed were Dallas Goddard, T Higgins, and Christian Kirk. Let's now jump Leone into four, five, and six here. Josh Jacobs running back of the Raiders faces your bills this week. By the way, if you guys don't know, Leone is one of the people that jumps off of the vans face first into the tables at Bill's tailgates. He's facing the bills this week. The thing for me on Josh Jacobs is in today's NFL, you do not see running backs used the way that Josh Jacobs is used. Not Christian McCaffrey, not Austin Eckler. You don't see guys getting 90, 95, 97% of a team's running back touches. That's what the Raiders have been doing with Josh Jacobs for the last two years. And so I don't even think about it. Josh Jacobs has a bad game. It is what it is. When you get 90% of a team's running back touches, you're in a good spot to bounce back at all times. And I think Josh Jacobs is like good slash decent, you know, and, and I think Jimmy Garoppolo is a little bit better than people think too. So absolutely no brainer not for me not to worry about Josh Jacobs. Doesn't mean he's going to have a good game here, but you just can't be sitting guys in fantasy who are going to touch the ball 15, 18, 20, 25 times. In a game, Leone, what do you think about Jacobs here against Buffalo? Yeah, I have an expected fantasy points model that basically just takes the player's usage on all their individual plays and aggregates it and tells you, you know, in general, how many points would a player have scored with this workload um, if, if they were to play this game over and over again? And for week one, Josh Jacobs was actually second among all running backs in my expected fantasy points model. He had you know, five carries inside the 10. Those are really positive. Those green zone touches. I mean, touchdowns are how you, how you hit your upside at running back at 19 carries overall still had a few targets in the past game. So 
I, I'm going right back to him. You know, it might not be an ideal matchup against Buffalo, but as you said, there's only a handful of guys that are going to get the type of workload that Jacobs does. So can't overthink matchup, can't panic here just because he didn't put up double digit fantasy points week one. You got to go back to the well. Oh, Right. Totally agree. We have some start sick questions from the chat. I always appreciate everyone in chat. Hey, Prod says, should I start Tua Tugavailoa or Brock Purdy? Now, everybody knows, of course, that Tua was one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback in the entire NFL here in week one. Brock Purdy, I thought, was also really, really, really good. And Brock Purdy gets a very Interesting matchup. I think a good matchup, despite what happened to Geno Smith against the Rams here. Leone, what do you think about Tua versus Purdy this week? Yeah, I mean, it was really good sign that Purdy left off, you know, where he was last year. You weren't sure if he was a flash in the pan or not. Uh, all that said, I think you got to play Tua over Purdy almost uh, all the time. You know, this Miami offense is too explosive with Waddle and and Tyreek Hill to throw to, and just the way Mike McDaniel is calling games. I just think the pass volume, and we saw that with the overall yardage that Tua had and the attempts that he had is going to outshine what Purdy can do, even though I like both quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, clearly the matchup, I think, is probably better for Purdy, but I also would not overthink it. I know going to New England is not like the cleanest spot for Tua, but yeah, I, I definitely think that um, I would go Tua there. Uh, keep keeping it moving here with the chat. Jalen Hurts or Joe Burrow straight up. I think this is going to be an easy answer for us all the time. When you have a choice between a guy like Jalen Hurts who can get you literally 100 yards rushing and multiple rushing touchdowns and 300 yard passing or just a guy who can get 300 yard passing, it's just a no-brainer every time. It's going to be Hurts over Burrow for me every time, regardless of matchup. Last chat here from Del Kojo says, DJ Moore or Tyler Algier. So this is an interesting reaction to week one. Tyler Algier actually got more opportunities than Bijan Robinson in that game against the Panthers and played very well, as we know that he will. Run game is awesome there. DJ Moore, they spent all this trade, trade capital on, all this money on, two targets for DJ Moore in week one. Justin Fields looked like he has not made any progress whatsoever as a thrower. So my first instinct is this is crazy. Of course, it's DJ Moore. He was drafted like 10 rounds ahead of Tyler Algier in fantasy. Would it be an overreaction in week one to week one, though, Leone, to start Algier over DJ Moore? I honestly think it's close. I think it's insane that DJ Moore only had two targets in a game where they actually threw a lot because there's going to be games where Chicago doesn't throw a lot. And that could happen this week where they only throw 23, 24, 25 times. And then... You know, if DJ Moore can't earn more than two targets, I mean, obviously his target share is going to go up. Um, so I think it's closer than it should be. Ultimately, you know, I'm going to bet on the talent of DJ Moore for another week. If the usage continues to be really favorable for Algier and really unfavorable for Moore, might switch that up in week three. But I think at least one more week, especially if it's a full PPR format, you got to go with the, the talented wide receiver here. Yeah, I mean, at some point, if the Falcons get behind, and I'm not saying they're going to get behind against the Packers, but if they do, and there's fewer running back touches to go around, Algier is going to look pretty, pretty thin. So yeah, I'd probably, I mean, we were pretty out on DJ Moore before the season, so I do not have any DJ Moore uh, on any of my teams. But if I did, I think I'd go back to him here over Algier. But yeah, it's not looking great for DJ Moore. Let's get to some of these more week one duds that we're thinking about starting here in week two five six and seven here number five on our list is drake london drake london was famously targeted just one time while mac hollins got four targets in that week one game the truth of the matter is this team does not want to throw the football they want to hide desmond ritter and when they do throw the football it's not like they're going out of their way to scheme stuff for drake london or kyle pitts they scheme stuff for cordero patterson who's coming back they seem to scheme stuff for Mac Hollins, why they don't scheme stuff for Drake London is absolutely beyond my comprehension, but it's true. All that said, Leone, guy's an alpha, man. I mean, Drake London on any other team would be just an absolute smash. Guy is very, very, very good at football, in my opinion. So what do you think about Drake London here against the Packers? Man, um, I'm a little concerned on this one. 
And I was high on Drake London because I think, like you said, he's an alpha. He can earn an alpha target share. But I also thought Atlanta would normalize a little bit more this season. You know, shame on me for thinking that. But if you listen to any of Arthur Smith's quotes, uh, he really doesn't care much about throwing the football as long as they get the W or are close. And if you look at their stats as a team from week one, they had the lowest pass rate over expectation. They were at negative 12.3%. That means, you know, relative game script down and distance, that stuff. They threw the ball, you know, 46% of the time, but we would have expected them a normal team to have thrown 58% of the time. So that's not a good sign. Their air yards were only 63 as a team. And a lot of those went Kyle Pitts's way. So I'm a little bit concerned on this one where honestly, if I had some wide receivers that popped earlier, like say flowers, popped in week one, you know, Jahan Dotson, some of these guys, um, maybe even like a Nico Collins, like I might go elsewhere. I don't know. I have to think through it, but um, no. definitely concern on London. No, no, no. Don't say that. I need, I need Drake London to have good games. Listen, they had worse quarterback play, I think, and just as bad of a scheme last year. And Drake London was still very, very good. I'm not ready yeah. to give up on Drake London here whatsoever. And I also think, yeah, the Packer, the Falcons need to be pushed for Drake London to have a good game. I thought Jordan Love looked pretty good. Now they're playing in the dome here, and maybe they get some guys back. Maybe Dobbs is healthier. Maybe by some miracle, Christian Watson's back. My, my point is that if the Packers get a lead and four out Falcons are forced to throw, it's going to look a lot better for Drake London. So, yeah, Zay, Zay Flowers over Drake London is an easy one for me, but I would not play Nico Collins over Drake London. Let's not be ridiculous here, uh, Leone. Let's go to number six. Jameer Gibbs got massively out-touched, out-snapped by David Montgomery in week one. He looked awesome, though. Quotes after the game from Dan Campbell were, yeah, Jameer Gibbs was a rookie. We didn't give any of our rookies a lot of run. Yeah, blah, 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 all this other nonsense. Jameer Gibbs is going to start to play more. Do you believe that, Leone? And what do you think about going back to Jameer Gibbs here against the Seahawks? I think he has the potential to be such an explosive player that I'm in on Gibbs. The usage was disappointing, but like we saw Swift with kind of similar usage last year, get there in a lot of games, you know, it was sort of frustrating, but I think Gibbs is going to ultimately have better usage than Swift had last year. And like, quite frankly, this is one of the games to target. We saw this matchup between these two teams last year being an absolute shootout. I want to play as many, you know, if it's a close sit start decision, players in this game are going to get priority for me. So I'm into Gibbs. I think just a little bit more usage and he's going to break some big plays. Plus that involvement in the passing game is so nice. So uh, I'm fine. You know, we, week one honestly wasn't that crazy from what we expected. We know they're going to lean on Montgomery and the way the game went to, it kind of allowed them to play a little bit more conservatively. It's going to open up in week two. Yeah. I mean, guy is a problem. I believe he led the NFL in broken tackles in week one despite hardly playing. I mean, it's crazy. He had like nine yeah. touches and he led and he led the league in, in broken tackles. Last guy, this one, this one scares me, man. Cause I just think Matt Canada doesn't really know what he's doing, but with Deontay Johnson out in theory, in theory, George Pickens should have an elevated target share. And I think most importantly, a different route tree than what he's had under Matt Canada. Under Matt Canada, George Pickens is mostly just run up the sideline and get some prayer yards, and they throw it down there, and they hope he can make some crazy contested catch, and he's done that. With Deontay Johnson out, they need George Pickens winning in different ways. So maybe I'm being too hard on Matt Cannon. Maybe George Pickens just can't do that. However, if I have George Pickens, I am definitely starting him here just on the fact that Deontay Johnson is such an elite target earner that has to get spread around. Calvin Austin, Allen Robinson, Pat Fryermuth are not going to earn targets at the rate that Deontay Johnson would have. So I'm not excited overly about this one, but I think you have to go back to George Pickens here. Any thoughts on Steelers wide receiver stuff, Leone? Yeah, I'm with you. I think you got to, I mean, if you're not going to play George Pickens now, it's probably not going to happen with Deontay Johnson out. Definitely like a little bit of concern that Cleveland's defense just dominates. You kind of alluded to them being possibly one of these awesome defenses, you know, given what they did to Cincinnati in week one. But uh, this is a guy who, you know, he's a prospect. A lot of people really like fell a little bit in the draft, not necessarily due to talent reasons. And the Steelers are going to have to throw a lot, you know, Matt Canada might not be great at scheming things open, but at least they're not 
just handing Najee the ball and, and running three yards into a pile of dust. I mean, they are a little bit, but their password of expectation was positive week one. If they have to throw, they will. So the volume should be there. And it's kind of like, let's see what Pickens can do with it. As you said, hopefully he's utilized in some more creative ways with Deontay out instead of just running fly routes. All right. Let's go ahead and take a few more questions from the chat here from DeAndre. He says, Jordan Addison, CD Lamb, or Keenan Allen in the flex. So DeAndre sounds like he has an absolutely loaded team to be picked <laughs> yeah. one of Addison, Lamb, and Keenan. Can I have your team, please, DeAndre? But anyways, I think the reason that people maybe are scared of starting CD Lamb here is because Jets defense has been so good. Jets corners are so good. I don't like to overthink it in these spots, especially with Brandon Cooks on injury report now with an MCL issue. It would be CD Lamb there. Uh, for me out of those three, not to take anything away from the spots for Keenan Allen and Jordan Addison. I do like the spots uh, for both those guys as well. Uh, question two from Austin. He says, Tyler Lockett or Puka Nakua? All right, baby. Puka's taken over the world, Leone. Tyler Lockett or Puka Nakua? I want to say, I don't think Puka is really a fluke. He played outside. He played inside. I think when Cooper Cup comes back, he can still play outside. Puka Nakua was second in the entire college football landscape in yards per route run last year. He's not like some fluke, weird prospect. I don't know, man. Puka versus Tyler Lockett. What do you think, Leone? Yeah, I mean, also like 15 target games don't just happen that randomly that often, especially in like a normal game script. It wasn't like New England where they were chucking for three and a half quarters against Philly because of the game script. Mm -hmm. So to get 15 targets in like a pretty normal game where they actually had the lead most of the second half was really impressive for Puka. So I think this one's actually extremely close. Our projections have it really close. I would probably in like a season long managed league, give the slight tiebreaker to some more certainty with Tyler Lockett. I also mentioned really wanting to target this Seattle Detroit game. So I think I'd go Lockett, but we literally in, in pure projection had them, you know, right next to each other. So I think, you know, Puka is legit. He's someone I spent a bunch on in fab to get on my teams. So, um, you know, it's, it's a good decision to have to make for your team, but I'd slightly lean lock it here. Question from Norman in chat. He says, notice Najee Harris is not on this list. You wouldn't give him a second chance in week two. So the reason that we overlooked Najee Harris here, Norman is we do not own any nor, uh, Najee Harris <laughs> on any of our teams because, uh, we were completely out on Najee Harris just based on him not being that good at football, offensive line being major problem, and Jalen Warren arguably being better and going to take snaps. And that's kind of the way we saw it play out in week one. Offense was disaster. Jalen Warren played a ton. The difference, though, is they were playing San Francisco. It was a tough spot. But they played Cleveland again this week. Certainly not a great spot for Najee. So the thing at running back is it's hard to have like a lot of better options than someone who's going to touch the ball 10 to 15 times like Najee will, right? So I wouldn't be excited about it, but I might go back to him. What do you think about Najee this week? Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, it's similarly tough spot as week one. Like this team is an underdog against a really good defense. And when you're playing an inefficient back who is now seeding some work to the backup uh, in a spot where we're worried about the offense, like th that's not a good spot to be in. I think Najee's going to have his games when – the, the offense itself performs in these easier matchups and he can get there just on the volume. He can get some short touchdowns, you know, he can get up to 18 carries or so. Um, but I don't see that being the spot this week. You know, we've got him for like 12 PPR points. So it's a fine projection. As you said, there aren't a ton of backs that are going to project better than that, but it's more like fringe RB two than it is a locked in RB one. I mean, there's better, if you were looking to like move on from Najee, I'd probably wait till he plays the Raiders in week three and the Texans in week four. Maybe he can do something there and you'll be able to get something yeah. for him at that point. Last one here, Mets fan Abby says, would you start Jalen Hurts or Kirk Cousins tonight? I have both. Yeah, that's a, a no brainer there again. If you have a pocket passer and you're comparing him to Jalen Hurts, there is absolutely no debate whatsoever. All right. Yeah, Hertz is our top projected scoring quarterback of all the quarterbacks. So if your question has to do with Jalen Hurts, the answer is <laughs> Jalen Hurts. All right. Speaking of Jalen Hurts, let's <laughs> jump into the fantasy bundles presented by our friends at State Farm. We're bundling your home and auto insurance 
is just another way to save with the personal price plan, State Farm Insurance. All right, the State Farm bundles for week two. The first one we actually wanted to highlight was one we've already been talking about. Jalen Hurts to Dallas Goddard. Now, talked about the squeaky wheel stuff, and we just talked about how with Dallas Goddard coming off the air ball, squeaky wheel, they already talked about featuring him. And you have Jalen Hurts in a bounce back spot against a really weak Vikings defense, and he's playing at home. Absolute smash, I think, here for the bundle tonight. If you told me who's going to score more points, like this one or Cousins versus Justin Jefferson, I would say that Cousins, Justin Jefferson would score more, but not like 100% of the time, probably not even like 80% of the time, maybe, you know, 55, 60% of the time or something like that. So really like the spot tonight for Jalen Hurts and Dallas Goddard. Leone, we already talked about that one, so maybe we should move on. Yeah, the let's look at bu- another fantasy bundle with uh, yeah, Justin Her- with Justin Herbert and Keenan Allen here. I think the game plan for the Chargers week one was like somewhat matchup specific. They actually ran a lot more than we expected them to, but their pace was still really good. So look for them to pass more aggressively week two. Tennessee's a bit of a pass funnel defense. They've got a really stout defense against the run and forces teams to throw more frequently. And I think the Chargers are a smart enough organization. Like they're going to do what works against the defense that they're facing. So combine that with really up tempo and, you know, Herbert Keenan, I think are pretty locked in for a high volume day. I really like this one. You know, like Leone said, I don't think they're a little bit of a pass funnel. I think they're a massive pass funnel. I mean, their defensive front is very good. Their secondary is not very good. Also, I would note for Keenan Allen, it's not great for Keenan and Eckler in the pass game when they're both out there. They kind of play in the same areas and they soak up a lot of targets together. Also, Eckler could miss this week with an ankle issue. We'll see. If he does, I think that helps Keenan Allen a lot in terms of how much volume he will see. Third one here is the Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen and Gabe Davis. We saw Steph Diggs have a bit of an alpha game against the Jets in a tough matchup. Now they get a much easier matchup. And to me, these are like the spots where you can get Gabe Davis going, hopefully. I think the Bills kind of think Gabe Davis isn't that good, but they don't have that much of a choice other than to play him on every snap. They just don't have anyone else to put out there. That's not the best ringing endorsement for Gabe Davis, but when you're <laughs> playing the Raiders, I think I think you have a chance at least. So what do you think about Gabe this week and Josh Allen here against the Raiders? Yeah, you know, that wasn't the hard sell, but it, it is a get right <laughs> spot for Buffalo after the collapse week one. And to your point though, Gabe Davis ran the most routes of any player on the Buffalo bills. One more than Stefan Diggs. He ran 47 routes. According to pro football focus, that's 96% route participation lines up with what we saw last week. They do not have anybody else to play that outside wide receiver spot. Now teams have been more conscious of taking away that deep ball that Gabe Davis gives them, you know, the last season or so, but he still has that really big play potential. He's a tall reliable red zone target. So um, he's someone that can get there on four, you know, four catches for really big plays. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely down with this pairing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard. I, I just tweeted an article. You can follow me at Adam Levitan on Twitter. I just tweeted an article about this new defensive trend in the NFL or newish defensive trend. Everybody playing these two high safeties, two high safety, two high safety. It's not great for guys like Gabe Davis, right? If everybody's going to play two high safeties, it's not great for Gabe Davis at all. So that's just something I'm watching, but I do think It's a pretty good spot here for Gabe Davis. Fourth bundle, Geno Smith and DK Metcalf. So this game last year, both teams scored over 40 points when the Seahawks and Lions played. Geno was awful, shockingly awful against the Rams in week one. If this game does go nuts, though, and I think it certainly has a chance to, that's what happens when these games happen in Detroit. I think DK Metcalf has to be a big part of it for the Seahawks. So what do you think about Gino's chances of a bounce back here, Leone with Metcalf? Yeah. I mean, I think we had him as a bundle last week. I don't know. I played him in my DFS lineups and it was a huge letdown. I'm not sure what happened. I'm keeping my eye on the offensive line injuries for Seattle. It seemed like they really had some issues after a couple guys left that game early. So I'm going to keep my eye on that. But ultimately, like you said, this game environment against Detroit is just so good that uh, I don't think it matters too much. And Metcalf is the bigger play wide receiver. And more importantly, he's the reliable red zone target for Gino down there. So I like it, Um, you know, frustrated with how it went last week, but I'm going to give Gino another week before I start to panic on him. 
Last bundle here, Anthony Richardson and Michael Pittman. I, I mean, I don't think it could have gone much better from a fantasy perspective in week one for Anthony Richardson. Not only did they give him six designed runs, not only did he get two carries from inside the five yard line, but also he completed 65% of his passes. And yeah, a lot of them were short. And, and they played the fastest pace in the league. And, and they had a first down throw rate that was eighth best in the league. I mean, this was like really optimistic, in my opinion, for Anthony Richardson. So yeah, I would be super excited about having him right now. Um, and quite frankly, I like, I didn't really take Michael Pittman much, if at all, uh, in the season long process. And I'm, I don't know if I'm regretting that as much as I would be regretting not having Anthony Richardson, but yeah, if it go, if he does well in the air, I think it's almost certainly through Pittman. What do you think about this one, Leone? Yeah, it was a full send for Richardson week one. We lost a couple prop bets on unders for Anthony Richardson because we did not expect him, as you said, to complete passes at the rate that he did, but also the play calling. They had a 68% pass rate in this game. They were slightly positive over expectation. Combine that with the pace. And we already knew that one positive for Pittman we knew coming in was just like this style of offense. Sometimes you're going to get a guy with a really high target share with some of like the RPO stuff and whatnot. He had the 28% target share. We just didn't think the volume that we saw in week one would be there or the completion rate. So now that there's at least a chance that both those things are going to stick around, you know, Pittman's fan, he's one of the guys, the fantasy stock for me has gone way up since prior to week one, where I thought it could be more of like what we saw with DJ Moore and Drake London. All right. We got a couple more minutes here. We'll wrap up with some questions from chat. Throw says DeAndre Swift or Alexander Madison tonight. It's an interesting question. I mean, Alexander Madison's workload was awesome in week one, just like we expected. I have efficiency concerns on Alexander Madison in this spot against the Eagles, but I don't even know what to expect from Kenny Gamewell. I mean, I'm sorry, from DeAndre Swift. I understand Kenny Gamewell's out. How do we know that Rashad Penny's not going to be the man tonight or, or Boston Scott's going to be the man at the goal line tonight. And so for me, I would just take the reliability in the touches for Madison over Swift tonight, which I know stinks because in theory, like you want to be playing DeAndre Swift now while Kenny Gamewell is out. Right. But what do you think about this one? Leone Swift versus Madison. Yeah, I think I'm with you on this one. I like, if you really feel like they're going to go fully to Swift, like, Swift with the same workload as Madison would be clearly the play here. The yeah. team that's going to score more points, the more efficient back, not close, but he might not even lead the Philly backfield in touches. And there's a lot of risk there. So I think I'm with Madison, unless you're just really in the mood to gamble on, on the pure upside of Swift. Miles says, is Saquon Barkley going to bounce back? Yeah. I mean, the Giants just didn't show up. I mean, no one on the Giants showed up whatsoever. Then this week they get to play the Cardinals. Like, Saquon would be one of my favorite guys to play this week. I would not be worried about Saquon. Matt Vera says he's stuck on his backs. Javante Williams, Alexander Madison, or Rashad White, he needs to bench one of them. I'd say this on Javante Williams. He looks reasonably healthy to me, and they are really involving their backs in the pass game, including Javante Williams. So that is a very, very good sign, a reasonable spot for Javante here home against the Commanders. Rashad White, on the other hand, like does not look very good, not very, very efficient. I think their run game is probably broken, but he played a ton. I mean, he played like 80% of the snaps. And we already talked about Madison. So this is a tough one. Leone, what do you think? Bench one of Javante, Madison, Rashad White. Man, it, this is a really tough one. Uh, you know, my gut instinct was to say Rashad White, but it is a more favorable matchup. And as you said, that workload was so good week one. So like I have these serious long-term concerns about Rashad White holding on to this job, but I think if I had to bench one um, with Denver going up against a good commander's defense, some comments about wanting to play actually the third running back there, McLaughlin, I'm going to, I'm going to say bench Javante here, but um, it's tough because you're starting Madison and white are two guys where they're very workload dependent. Neither of them are efficiency guys, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go with them given that Javante has a tough matchup anyways. Yep. All right. Last one we're going to do here today. Aztec thunder, Juju Smith Schuster or Terry McLaurin. So, I got bad news, uh, Aztec Thunder. <laughs> Juju might be dusted, man. I'm sorry to say it. He might just be done. Seems like the knee is still a problem. Report today out of New England said the Patriots might view Juju Smith-Schuster as their fifth best pass catching option. We're including Hunter Henry, Mike Jasicki in there. Kendrick Bourne looked really good last week. Devontae Parker could be back. So 
I don't think you can start Juju Smith-Schuster, period, right? Like, I don't care who you said. And Terry McLaurin is a good player, man. So, yeah, I think it's a no-brainer. Terry McLaurin, like, if you had to drop Juju at this point, I wouldn't hate you for it, man. I mean, it looks real bad for Juju right now. And by the way, you're not the only one that may have had a bad talent about on Juju Smith-Schuster. The Patriots let Kobe Myers walk and gave Juju Smith-Schuster a very, very similar contract, which is proving to look very, very stupid. All right. That is going to do it for this week's Bleacher Report Fantasy Football Show brought to you by State Farm. Remember, we don't need to overreact to week one. We also don't need to underreact. There was a lot of stuff to react to, a lot of the usage stuff. Some of the stuff like T. Higgins, Dallas Goddard Air Balls, Saquon Barkley. That's the stuff I wouldn't worry about too much. Thanks so much for having us today, everyone at the Bleacher Report team. Thanks so much to everyone for tuning in. If they have us back, we'll be back next week for... Mr. Leone, you can follow him on Twitter at two hats, one mic. Follow me at Adam Levitan. And by the way, if you're serious about fantasy football, you got to be on Twitter. I'm not just saying that to pump my own bag. You got to be on Twitter. That's where all the best fantasy football information is. For Leone, for for Leone, for me, Adam, for everyone behind the scenes at Bleacher Report, good luck, everybody.